Welcome to the No Pressure, No Diamonds podcast, where entrepreneurs come to harness their struggles, doubt, fear, negativity, and setbacks. They place pressure on the blessing of adversity to become the strong, fearless, excited, passionate winner they were destined to be, a A diamond. diamond. Let's go ahead and talk about the Anchor app real quick. So if you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way, simply the easiest way to record and make a podcast. First of all, (laughs) it's free. Uh, Second thing is there's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast across a litany of platforms like Apple, Spotify, and many, many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. So that's cool. Right. And, you know, it's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So go ahead and download the free, let alone go ahead and download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Now, let's go back to regular scheduled program. Peace man but guess what man we're back yes sir. we're back we're back once again my name is alex rose and i got my boy thomas solano yeah man this is the no pressure no diamonds podcast we have a great great episode in store for you but before we get started just remember to like share comment um, go to the npndpodcast.com to get all your episodes and subscribe as well so you can get all future episodes to get notified for that um, but man, we have such a great guest on here today. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, I mean, super excited. And this is this is coming from. All, I mean, from <laughs> we have a guest literally on the other side of the world. Basically, I think right. Is that is that safe to say? Yeah, it's been a while since I was in high school. Richard could probably help us out, but I know it's it's somewhere <laughs> far away. <laughs> you know, literally from from coast to past another coast. Uh, so excited to have this gentleman on the on the podcast today, Mr. Richard Blank. Uh, but before we get started, I'm gonna just go over go over a little bit about who it is, uh, who he is uh, here. I mean, he's a chief executive officer uh, for Costa Rica's call center. Uh, actually, been living in Costa Rica, I believe he said 22 years. Correct. That is correct. All right, man. You know, been living in uh, but been, been, been living in Costa Rica for for just that long, but ha- but has built a very successful business, um, in in a in a in a totally different country, um, and is being very successful in coaches and mentors, uh, many employees and entrepreneurs as well. And we we want to get into that today and have a have a more in depth conversation on uh, Mr. Blank's story, uh, and and talk about how he took his. How he took a how he took himself to another country and was able to build a successful business, right, and be able to you know contribute mm-hmm. to that country and do great things as well. Um, so, Mr. Richard Blank, how you doing today? Uh, we appreciate you for hopping on the show, and uh, let's get into it. How, how's it going? I'm doing great, gentlemen. I can't thank you enough for having me as your guest on today's podcast. And Alex and Thomas, I, you guys are so much fun. I know your best friends. So being able to sit with two best friends and being a third wheel, you know, I'm going to get some great advice from the both of you. So uh, really looking forward to sharing ideas today. Well, appreciate it. And uh, so, so let's go ahead and get it started here. So, so let's start, let's go, I'm not going to say way back, right? Because so, so I'm not going to say way back. In but, West but like, Philadelphia, <laughs> born and raised. Um, <laughs> Actually, Thomas, it's Northeast Philadelphia, born okay. and raised. I, um, I graduated from the proud Abington High School back in 1991. And like a lot of my friends that were studying medicine and law, architecture and engineering, my favorite class was recess, but I couldn't make a living off of that. So (laughs) I I had to choose Spanish. And I doubled down on that. I, I went to the University of Arizona because Philly's cold in the winter. And I was a Spanish communication major. I studied what you guys did, uh, public speaking and rhetoric and micro expression reading for special sauce. During college, I interned for Telemundo. Post-grad, I worked for the importers of Corona. So your buddy always had a fun job and it always involved (laughs) Spanish and promotions and public relations. And then when I was 27 years old, a good friend of mine gave me a one and a million opportunity. He said, Richie, why don't you come to Costa Rica for two months, teach some English at my call center? Well, guys, if you can get past your parents' guilt, you can live anywhere in the world. So I packed up my stuff and I went south. Costa Rica is north of Panama, south of Nicaragua, smack dab in Central America. It's the Mm. only democratic society 
amazing infrastructure, no standing army, 95% literacy rate, and their expression here is pura vida, which means pure life. They're very, very big on ecotourism. So imagine this Philly boy that goes to Arizona that walks off the plane here. I said, you gotta be kidding me. So I get one more chance to enjoy my youth. I'm definitely gonna take this opportunity. And so I worked with my friend for four years, but here's the best part. When I was with the people, sitting with the Ticos, these bilingual agents on the phone at a call center, it's not what you see in the movies. A lot of people earn a living working in customer support and sales on the phone. And so I respected what they did. I realized how hard it was for them to get to that level. And now they're reaping the rewards of that education as I would with my Spanish. But here's the best part, guys. I saw ways to enhance the experience for the agent and for the client. I saw the empathy side. And I realized that if I ever had the opportunity to run a company, the number one thing that I would do was to give them their dignity and not treat them like a number or a robot. Because I believe, gentlemen, that is the core of how I've been successful all of these years. You know, want to so I want to unpack a little bit. So I'm gonna take it back a little bit as well. So now, do you have a? Are, so do you have a? Were you raised like in a Spanish household? Were you? Uh, you know, is your is either parent on either side have a Spanish background? Like, what made you want to take that? You know take a span, you know, learn Spanish, first of all, like what made you want to learn that language? It's a great story. In fact, my family comes from Europe. I'm Romanian and Russian, German and Polish on both sides of my family. So nobody in my family speaks Spanish, except my cool uncle, uh, Aunt Roberta that drove a vet back in the day that inspired me. But um, there are certain times, Thomas and Alex, that you are given opinions, or that there are sort of predestined careers that are set up for you, expectations. And so for me, it, it concerned me because I was more of like this dreamer that believed that by learning a second language, it might make me marketable and open some doors. Mm -hmm. And so when my grandfather goes to Harvard Law, my father goes to Columbia Business School, my older brother goes to Washington and Lee University. That's a pretty high bar there. I was not on a roll. I couldn't compete with those educational goals there. And in fact, if it wasn't for the college recommendation letter that I got from my principal at Abington, I don't know if I would have gotten into Arizona. And so maybe I was the black sheep of my family. Maybe I was not mature enough to take my study seriously. But if my family is going to force me in a box to do something that felt like homework for the rest of my life, you wouldn't see the smiling cat that you did today. But my argument for them was, what happened to great grandma and great grandpa? They came over from Europe. They were entrepreneurs at the turn of the century. They learned a second language and built a business. How could you say for me not to do that when that's what they did? So when I was 18 years old, I realized the power of rhetoric and I checkmated them on an argument on why I should study this in college. And as I mentioned, doubling down on that and tripling down on that. And I know that you're expecting a teenage whiz kid or a genius in their 20s that started their business, but I'll be forthright with both of you. It took me till my mid 30s to start this company. I needed my impulse control, maturity, and some money saved, mm. and realizing that it's responsible for payrolls. And, you know, these are multi generational families here, and a lot of the agents do take care of their grandparents and parents. So you almost have to hold that sort of responsibility sacred. And, and that's my commitment to them here. Mm -hmm. Well, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting. Uh, you know, and when you said have a little more maturity, more impulse control, um, have a little bit of a financial wherewithal, right? When it came to getting your business off the ground, I think um, that's that's an interesting take because there are there are some folks that are out there that when they want to start a business, they're like, man, like everything's not in not in, you know, not lined up, right? Like, man, I don't, I don't have the, like, maybe they, they don't have the funds. They maybe not, they don't necessarily have well, the money think, or they don't I, have. I think the challenge for most yeah. people is initially it's entrepreneurship. It, it generally um, 
is there's some selfish intention there, right? Like I want to be my own boss. I don't want to have to clock in. I want to make my own. I want to do what I want to do. And so when you have that going into that entrepreneurship journey, having that impulse control or the acceptance of responsibility of others is usually like one of the furthest things down on the list, right? Like that's something that's learned in the process of growth. So it's impressive that you realize that early on up front, and it's probably why you've experienced the success you experienced. Would you, would you agree with that, Richard? Well, I, I absolutely would, Thomas, but mind you this, I learned it from the inside out. When I worked at my friend's call center, I was not C-level. I didn't know about the contracts or the finances behind it. But in the course of four years, I was given the opportunity to go into retentions, customer support, sales. I also learned about the human resources department, onboarding training, and also affiliate management for search engine optimization. So in essence, it was really my graduate school. I, I believe before somebody takes that sort of endeavor and begins a company, they should do their due diligence or at least try it first. I had the opportunity to see where I could enhance and improve these skills if I may share something else with you. Now, I was slow and steady. My grandparents told me if I couldn't pay for something in cash, then you don't do it. And so for me to be able to start a company, I had to start somewhere. So what I did was I was working out of my home. I, I created a website. A couple months later, I landed my first account in February of 2008. But I was renting a turnkey station at more of a glorified internet cafe where it was just an open floor plan. There was no privacy, but at least for that month, I could pay to have an agent with a computer, a headset, internet, security, and coffee in the kitchen. And it's not <laughs> special, but it's a start. And you started adding up those seats. Now I did that for a couple of years. So once you start getting to four or five dozen agents, it doesn't make financial sense, but I had enough reserves to then rent a space to build out 150 stations, buy the equipment, and go that way. Now, you have import tax here. And why would I pay top dollar? There's a lot of companies that were either going out of business or were pretty much giving me equipment that they bought, but we're still in the box. So if you want to consider that used, I'll take that all day long. And so I had individuals representing me that were going around the country and finding the best deals because look at me, you know, they're going to charge another 20% if they see me. And so I had individuals representing me. And getting the best prices and my attorneys making sure that the contracts are good my accountants paying the taxes here and doing things correctly and then after those years i saved enough money to build a building to put 300 seats so it, it's more of the tortoise not the hare and you're not going to believe this in 2010 i took a huge shot i put all my eggs in one basket and i almost went out of business i went from 90 seats down the floor but i had enough acorns to survive the winter. And I am a CEO and I buy jute boxes and pinballs and, the, and I do enjoy myself, but I also had plenty of reserves to be able to weather any storm. And so my responsibility is to make sure my agents get paid and I pay my taxes and that I can continue my business because there are ups and downs. And so that was probably one of the biggest lessons that I had learned in regards to being a responsible business owner. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I appreciate you clarifying that. I think that was the point that I was trying to make is that that responsibility you learned sooner than most people do, right? And, and and it was probably there was a goal or something attached to that, meaning you wanted the growth and the expansion and you realized that that was going to take uh, attention uh, somewhere else, right? A attention on others and uh, their ability to provide versus everything for you, right? Meaning you put more back into your business before you decided to take out, which I think is an area where a lot of entrepreneurs make a mistake. They do it a little bit backwards, right? They're buying the fancy cars and doing all that stuff. So yeah, um, yeah I appreciate you clarifying that. Forgive me if I missed the transition, Richard. So you, so you are, uh, initially went out to Costa Rica. You spent four years there with a buddy of yours. So your buddy had a business that mm. you went to help. And is it in the same field, the same industry, or did you it just was, learn? It, it was a call center for his business. Okay. So I had the opportunity just to teach English. Uh -huh. And then I just asked if I could stay. And he goes, what do you want to do? I go anywhere you want to put me. <laughs> and so, as I say, I was his eyes and his ears 
And I was, since English was my native tongue, it enabled me to expand their vocabulary with a thesaurus so they could find more similes to be able to communicate better. And there were certain things I did in the quality assurance department where I was able to grade their calls through KPIs, which are key performance indicators. I, I learned how to structure a phone call so you can do proper coaching. So you don't waste time and there's some consistency. And Meaning so like they, scripts? Not just scripts, but let's just say hypothetically that you're making an outbound call to qualify someone. I would have to ask mm -hmm. you, is, is this Tommy? Tommy, um, would you like to buy this Corvette? And how much would you like to spend? And what is your email address? Okay, great. So I mean, something like that, I'd make sure that you ask the questions, but I go, no, 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 that's what I'm paying you to do. I want the soft skills. I want Tommy to say your name. I want you to ask Tommy what his favorite color is for the Corvette. I want him to picture, is it gonna be a convertible, which I would prefer, maybe a Stingray, but I wanna know where Tommy's gonna go with this Corvette and who he's gonna be in his passenger seat where he's chilling. And so that's the important thing for me because if somebody is anchoring and making that connection with somebody on the phone, then that's important for me. And it's, how about this gentleman, since everybody is working from home now and mm -hmm. you might hear a dog in the background, instead of just you know letting the call get killed, I would first tell them in the Me Too technique how much I love dogs. Then I'd ask the follow-up question and say, what's the dog's name? And you're gonna say Diamond. Diamond sounds like a great dog. It's very loud. Why don't you put it outside? And so when you come back to the call, instead of me trying to close you or set the appointment, no, Alex and, and, and Thomas, we're going to sit and talk about Diamond for a minute. And then you're going to ask me again what my name is. And then I use a buffer boomerang technique by saying, hey, that's an excellent question, Alex. My name, once again, is Richard Blank. <laughs> so I just bring back your active listening question, repeat it, name drop you, and send it back at you. And so these are the sort of controlled systems that I have here for my agents to be very structured on these calls. And so I'll give you another example. Since there is a dog barking or a bad cell phone connection, it's just saying, hey, Alex, can you repeat that? Thomas, what, what did you say? No, gentlemen, for my clarification, did you say ABC or one, two, three? These are small swords that you could fall on to avoid any sort of rabbit holes or any sort of ego defense. And so I believe active listening is key. I think you need to ask tie down questions if things make sense or sounds good right. And my favorite thing, here's your million dollar answer. When you're calling a company and someone assists you before being transferred, I speak to Alex, want to speak to Thomas. And the first thing I do is no pain, no diamonds. How you doing today? I'm going to ask how your company is doing today. Alex says everything's doing great. He's going to ask me my name. Alex, that's an excellent question. My name is Richard Blank. Alex likes me, gonna transfer me to Thomas. I'm gonna say, hey, Alex, just wanna let you know when I speak to Thomas, I'm gonna let you know how great you are. So I get transferred to the gift of a positive escalation. Before Thomas even knows me, I'm gonna go, hey, Thomas, I gotta let you know, Alex is the greatest employee you got working there. He's gonna go, yeah, I know, who are you? <laughs> Once again, a buffer boomerang. And so these are the sort of relationship building that you can do on the phone with people to decrease any sort of resistance, at least get you some time to pitch yourself. And if you're giving mm. positive escalations and you're doing active listening, so instead of horizontals, you're vertical and asking open-ended questions when people are interested in what you're discussing, ah, your visit's gonna fly everywhere and people are gonna be much more fulfilled on the phone. They, they won't be plastic, guys. They're gonna be paintings. Mm. They're gonna be raw. They won't be a character, they'll be in character. And I think that's why, besides you two being best friends, that's why you two are successful in your own proper fields, because it's more empathy. You guys love your clients and they know it. And that's why you get tons of referrals in what you do. Yeah, it sounds like uh, you've, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that a lot of what you did revolves around the understanding of human psychology. Did, is that something that you've studied, like human nature, psychology, or is this just through kind of trial and error or monitoring? And My main focus there with my example is conflict management. Now, my specialty is phonetic micro expression reading because oh, I'm man. in an environment that does not have sight right and so i can't mm -hmm. gauge your reactions your nodding heads taking notes smiling thumbs up i can't see that over the phone we, we can talk about that in a bit 
But since I'm in a controlled environment here, I'm eliminating three of my senses, your taste, touch, and smell. And so I'm expecting their hearing to be expanded and you're claiming they can't see the client, not on a Zoom, on a call, but what happens to image streaming? You know that a book is 10 times better than a movie. And so by using adjectives and additional descriptions on the phone, I think that you'll have much more better conversations with people. And so these are the sort of things that I encourage them to do. But there is a section, and if I may show it to you, it's called phonetic microexpression reading. Phonex is broken down into four stages, tone rate, pitch, and duration. You gentlemen in abundance, your tone is confident and empathetic. That needs to be consistent variable. The mirror imaging technique is usually done on speed and on pitch. You should gauge mm -hmm. conversations every 30 seconds to two minutes. And every conversation has an introduction body and a conclusion. And so when you're just meeting somebody for the first time, I don't know who you are. It's like a boxing round. First round is different from the sixth to the 12th. And so every 30 seconds, to two minutes, if you're consistently speaking to me in a certain way, I may not ask you a tie down question. I'm getting a, a, a checkpoint. But if you happen to do a spike or a dip, that's when you interject and ask that confirmation pinned on question. But somebody can manipulate their tone, their rate <laughs> and their pitch. But Thomas, you're gonna love this. You mentioned psychology. You know, when they do it in their subconscious, they can't control their answering speed. So I believe that that is their real tell sign. Not saying that someone is lying to you, Alex, but maybe Thomas, these individuals that are saying something to you are not consistent or congruent where their audio matches their visual. And so you might ask them for more additional clarification diplomatically because you called them out on it. And so I hate mm. to say it, they're not gonna be able to cover that. And so me doing this over the phone, it's the purest form of speech is the phonetic. Well, how do you study that, Richard? Well, once you see it, you don't unsee it. Three weeks, it becomes a habit. But if you really wanna practice it, go watch the Chinese channel. I can't understand a single word, but I can understand the rate in their pitch and their pauses. So there's no vocabulary, there are words that I know, but it is a mastery of the phonetic delivery. And this is something that you can do while you're working. It just makes you a little more astute and lucid when you're getting either positive or negative reinforcement with those with whom you're speaking. And so this could really put somebody in the now. So they're not anxious of the future, or depressed from the past. They're literally in this 30 second to two minute moment and manipulating a conversation just to ensure that we're on the same page. And so these are some of the advanced skills that we master here. Yeah, and I I personally believe that they're necessary and essential, especially in that like call center setting, because I mean I I'm speaking for myself, but when I receive a call from one of those numbers that I don't recognize, and I don't know if that's exactly what it is that you're doing there, but they have three seconds to catch my attention, and and if they don't, it's a goodbye like pretty quickly. So. I think it's fascinating that you're teaching some of those things um, or all of those things, I would say. It's also interesting, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but you said something that made me think of when I was a kid, Richard, I actually used to mute the channel 34, which I think was television or something like that, um, huh? Univision. I used to put those shows on mute and fill in based on their movements and things like that. So I think I was studying phonetic micro expression, if that's, if that's what you called it, uh, when I was a kid. And maybe it's one of the reasons why I enjoy communication so much. But um, man, that was interesting. May I make a suggestion? And, and you, look how excited I am right now. Take any time <laughs> you record yourself three ways, non-visual, non-sound, and then you do the combo. Mm -hmm. So why don't you analyze how you and Alex and myself are interacting and you can fill in the blanks. That's kind of fun, right? It's almost yeah. like Mystery Science Theater 3000. And then you do it non-visual. So then you're guesstimating your reactions and combo it together. Right. Brilliant, Thomas. And if you do something like that, you'll actually be able to observe yourself more in a neutral and an arbitrary way where there's no emotion to it. And if you're capable of doing something like that, it's almost like the mirror to make your beard perfect as it is right now. And so 
you know, it's an excellent way. My friend, if you want to study yourself like that, that's an excellent dedicated practice, an additional skill that you can do off the air that you and Alex can go back and forth on or, or just do it on your own, my friend. And, and that will just make you much more effective communicator. You know, it's interesting. I, want to, I wanted to kind of dive into the, the business aspect of about what it is that you do as well. And um, Richard, it's one of the things that stuck out to me is, you know, a call center, right? So what types of, like if somebody was like, you know what, I'm excited, you know, I may be an employee of a call center and I really like what I'm doing. I may be a manager here or something of that, uh, of that, of that ilk. And like, like I'm able to do this, by my, you know, maybe it'll do this as a business. What types of, what types of, you know, what would it take for somebody to get started with that? Right. Like, yeah. You know, so when you got started, you were, you know, so, so were you being a call center for your friend's business or did you find, um, did you find businesses or find other companies that needed representatives and you were, you know, and you had to go get contracts with those companies uh, from the beginning. So how did that really work and how, and how could somebody um, really get started with the, with the call center type of business? Well, if anybody enters the call center business, fortune favors the brave. You better have some fidelity because if you don't love this, you're definitely not going to last. But no, I, I started off, as I mentioned, one seat, 50 hours, and I prospected my own business. I'm very heavy on search engine optimization so people can easily find me. And I like to share a lot of information prior to the phone call. I'll be forthright with you. I lose a lot of business by default because I can't match the offshore prices in Philippines and India, but that's okay. Uh, usually, as I say before, people meet me on the phone and Thomas, you brought up three seconds. A lot of people don't even get that. But if I can get that first three seconds, maybe I can earn another 30 and then just keep mm. gaining minutes with Thomas by repeating his questions to show active listening. Mesh, you never know. But the most important thing is when people call me is to share my experience and resources. So from an educated position, they can make a decision with me. But um, as a business owner, once again, it's from my stability comes from being able to delegate and being able to from promote from within. And so in order for me to scale my business, I might have to bring in some people that have never worked at a call center before, but they have the skills. Now, they're not coming in with bad habits. I'm going to let them know through the psychology of selling that learning a second language is 10 times harder than what they're about to do. So let's put that into perspective. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I'm going to prepare you. So I'm going to reduce that fear. And thirdly, I'm going to be very selective of the campaigns that come in so you can go home and tell your parents what you do for a living. I will not compromise your ethics, values, and morals. And so if I can have that sort of agreement with the agent and they can start relaxing, there's no reason why we can't compound on those skills and in a very short period of time, make a very strong name for themselves. And so if nobody comes back and if people just quit, and I have natural attrition. I compete against Amazon here. So people may leave me because of a better schedule for their school or a boyfriend or girlfriend works there or, or possibly it's closer to their home. But, you know, Alex and Thomas, very rarely someone's going to say Richard defaced me on the floor. They didn't pay me on time. They yelled at me. That doesn't happen. But I get disappointed more than I do angry. Like if I work with somebody and have a good run with them, sometimes I don't get a two weeks notice. They just peace out on me and just go somewhere else. And I'm responsible to call my client, which is fine because it solidifies the relationship I have with them because there's no surprise and I always have solutions. But somebody should at least look me in the eye and say, it was great working with you and thank you and be responsible to give me two weeks so I can replace them. But, you know, as I say before, that's some of the things we have to deal with here. And I don't take it personal because both the three of us know that we all do our best to create the most wonderful work environment. And so that's why I get more disappointed than I do angry when there's that sort of attrition. Would you learn most about yourself in the early days of starting your business? I would say before you got to, you know, your first, like say 10 or 20 um, agents. And the second part of that question is, what'd you learn about yourself in recruiting people to your business, right? So as you were growing from one person to two to three to four, and beyond, um, how did you how did you recruit people, right? With you know, so, uh, how did you bring people on board to your business? 
Okay, two excellent questions, easily answer both of them. I told you one hour, 50 seats. Then I closed two one-seaters that month. And then a couple of months later, I ripped a nice campaign that started with five seats and then grew to a monster size. I started by myself in the beginning doing the contracts, HR and payroll, but then I got way over my head. And my wife, who was a top jewelry saleswoman at the airport for Cafe Brit and was doing very well, she decided to resign from that job, work with her husband, and she and I have built this business together. There's no way I could be mm. without her. And so- Secret sauce, we found oh, yeah. it. <laughs> Guys, I might be the owner, but my wife, Grace Bravone, she's the boss. <laughs> and you know how that goes. But uh, almost like a horse that's, you know, walks on the, on the trail and then all of a sudden you hold on and it's just running like crazy. And it hasn't stopped. So I'm mm. on this 14 year run now. How to get people, that's very easy. You just got to be competitive. It's, you know, before is the newspapers, but now it's very heavy on search engine optimization. And, and I'm pretty much the top one in the country in regards to that. But, you know, people coming in here, they fill out the resume and they have the work experience and they write in all the bells and whistles. I'm reliable, responsible, want to grow. And I go, time out for a second. Why don't you turn the page over? And give me a couple paragraphs on a coming of age moment. They look at me and go, what's a coming of age moment? That's an excellent question, my good friend. It's when you first beat up the bully or got the kitty out of the tree. First, I want to read your English and your grammar and your spelling, but I want to learn something about you. And so you get to see if somebody on the flip side can actually give you something real about them, not just a canned response that they give to everybody. This isn't duck, duck, goose. I really want to know that you're legitimate. And I want to see if you can tell me about a time that you did save the princess and slay the dragon. I don't do it for that, for the hiring. I do it for the rainy Wednesday when somebody is having a tough time at home, wants to quit, or somebody on the phone says F you to them and really almost ruins their day. And I will walk past them and remind them when they were the champ and to get back to where they were. And if I may, even though it's cross-cultural, I will give them a little Philly guilt. I'll say, hey, Alex, you know you're better than that. Come on, Thomas, that's out of character. And then I'll give them the face and they go, I'm sorry, Richard. I go, we're good. And then, you know, they go back and do what they have to do. It's just proper coaching and mentorship. It's not second chances. They don't need a second chance. They're still rolling strong on their first. When we were younger, we had people that adjusted our swing and adjusted our head and people that said, go Richard, go. And so success is built on 1 million thank yous. And so this is the wind in my sails that continues to make me successful. So gentlemen, I can't stress enough the sort of relationship you have with your people. Because if nobody shows up, you know, you have no friends at the Chuck E. Cheese birthday party. And so, you know, I'm only as good as the, I'm only as good as the agents that come here and we're 150 strong. And I'm very proud of that. Mm. Can, can you talk a little bit, Richard, about, you said you had put all your eggs in one basket and it almost killed your business. Like you went from 90 to four or something like, what, what exactly did you mean by that? What, what, what happened? And then how did you bounce back? How'd you recover? Well, it was for a debt settlement company. In 2010, they changed the laws where you couldn't charge upfront fees. So this one company that I worked with had to downsize since so they downsized in Costa Rica. And we grew so well because comparing ourselves to corporate, we exceeded expectations. That's why I gained the seeds. But going down to four taught me multiple things. First is three words, one trick pony. I wasn't sure if I was a one hit wonder. I wanted to see if lightning could strike twice. And so as much as I'm unhappy that it happened, it also makes today sweeter and gives me a, a reinforcement that what I was doing is correct. Now, let's talk about the four people that were still with me. Mm. They saw what was going on. And I spoke with each one of them individually and let them know what happened, but also let them know that the accounts that they're on are stable. You know me. You saw this place packed and you see how hard I work. So if you give me the commitment to continue to make your campaign stable, I will work my tail off to make sure this company grows again. Now, two out of those four people are still with me today. And you know, 
they've how, grown. How long ago was that? Uh, this was in 2010 when okay. I almost, you know, my second year in, right? When I built out my new center. <laughs> so, you know, it was just one mm -hmm. of those times where you thought you gained momentum and then you hit a brick wall, but I never went to zero. Those four agents could have jumped ship. They could have gotten a job at Amazon, but I guess they respected me enough to not let me end my run. And so you have to understand psychologically that would have set me back just a touch, but no, there's that sort of, sort of spirituality where you never go to zero. And so it makes you humble. And so to mm. this day, I keep reminding them of the time when I was the most vulnerable and they could have taken advantage of that, but they didn't. And so what would you, uh, what would you attribute that respect that you said uh, to? Would it be the transfer of skill or uh, did you constantly let your people know that you cared about them? Or was that more of a feeling versus something that you vocalized? Well, where would you say that respect came from? Sincerity. But, but besides that, how about the fact that I invested my youth to learn your language and the fact that I am feeding families here and you see that I live far away from my family and I'm trying to set a nice example for an expatriate and for a business owner. And so by having these conversations <clears throat> with these agents and being forthright with them and treating them as a real human being and not hiding something behind the curtain, maybe just by having that sort of, you know, real conversation with them, I was able, because what are you going to tell them? Ship is sinking. You're barely there. There's a little bit of cheese, but there's a little bit of a spark and they're that. Mm. I need them to grow this thing again for just me and that energy. And so I couldn't spin it. I just had to let them know that they are imperative for the synergy of this company that will rebuild again. And maybe they did believe in something like that. And it was a vision quest, a spiritual journey for them as well to participate in something. And that's what builds character. You judge somebody's character when they have your back during the toughest times. And a lot of people that I expected to step up to the plate during COVID, during those years, disappointed me so. And then there were others that just all of a sudden rose from the ashes like the phoenix and showed me incredible leadership and resilience. And all that did was make my foundation even stronger. And so my relationships are built on merit and I could be bringing all the things we love and hold so dear in the United States, but that stuff doesn't mean anything here. And mm. so the best thing I could do is just be me and, and to show my essence. And that has enabled me to be embraced and to incorporate their culture into my life. And so I've almost lived half my life here. And as much as it sounds amazing, it really to me was just a natural progression of where I was going in life. And so I just try to give that back to the agent in that very sort of, not just sincere, but authentic way. And Thankfully, it was received in a certain way where I was supported. That's, you know, <laughs> it's like you you can never pick your winners too uh, never pick your winners too soon, right? And people will show will will show themselves um, if you allow them to. And what I learned is is those folks respect you know that they seen you work, they seen the proof is in the pudding. This sure. is just a this is a bump in the road <laughs> you know and and, he, and even if they're like i don't know what's gonna happen but you know what mr you know where is it we're gonna we're gonna hop on your coattails right because your belief was there and there's something about somebody that has a strong sense of belief in what they're saying right when you could tell somebody when they believe what they're saying it's like, like well, a good friend of mine uh, Sulu, uh, a great friend of ours i mean he says you know what People don't have to believe what you're saying. They just got to believe that you believe what you're saying. They have to believe that you believe it. And people will follow people like that, right? People will follow you um, when you're 
when you're, uh, I like to say, 10 toes down and standing on your square, and they know that you're not going anywhere, and come hell or high water, you know, it'll, it'll take an earthquake, it'll take a hurricane, a tornado, you know, whatever. It, it, it'll take everything that, that the world can throw at you, and you're still going to be standing. Or at least your shoes will still be there, right? <laughs> Even if yeah, we're dying with our boots on, I got you. Yo, <laughs> you know, you so, know the three of us go the distance. We're going 15. Mm -hmm. Even if we lose the fight, we're going to pull the Chuck Wepner versus Ali. We're going the distance. We're going mm -hmm. to be rocky. And that's just how it is. And I could have always clicked my heels and gone home and had people say, I told you so. Well, then so be it. But send at the least flowers. at the end of the day, I could look at myself in the mirror and be like, right on. Your soul is pure. You are true to yourself. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Man. Well, that's Amen why I, that. I asked that question for, you know, th those that tune in that are in a leadership position or aspiring to be in a leadership position, because there was some, some nuggets in there with the transparency, the vulnerability displayed, the care for others. Um, like Alex mentioned, the belief in a bigger picture, that long-term vision. Um, and so I wanted you to kind of, you know, dive in on, on that, which again is why I asked that question for those that are listening, because there's some gold in there with how you treat people. Uh, and when people are treated right, uh, they'll realize that, you know, the, the grass is worth watering and it's not always greener on the other side, you know? So um, I appreciate that story, Richard. You're welcome, Thomas. It's about self-reliance and self-confidence. Our goal collectively is to be the last boss your employees ever have, right? So we've prepared them enough to become leaders. And if they keep the tradition that the three of us have by breaking bread with those that work with us to know their names and to be very responsible in regards to finances in the business, that's what you're supposed to do. And as much as you're upset that they leave you, they're the ones that are gonna bump into you at the mall and say, listen, this was the best boss I ever had. And that's one of the greatest compliments you could ever receive. Absolutely. Yeah. Whether, whether they stay or not, you know, I, I share that, I share that, uh, that hope is that people will always say, you know what, I, I was better for knowing him. Like the time that I spent with him was worthwhile for sure. So yeah. You're right. yeah. valuable relationships, man, relationships, relationships are currency, right? You know, relationships are currency and, and got to keep water in that grass and, and focus on 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 treating people that they want to like they want to be you know like they want to be treated and, uh, and showing respect and giving it and um, respect is earned right you know it's earned and 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 but we definitely want to want to make sure that we're uh, just putting good energy out there and and communicating with people consistently right Cons constant communication because I feel like a lot of times that when there's a break in communication for a while we you know, sometimes we're, we're, we might be going in the same direction a little bit, but we might be on two different tracks, right? So we want to make sure that we're constantly communicating, you know, with the people that we're working with, our business partners, our, um, our employees, and they, uh, and, and they know the vision, right? And hey, we're Alex, doing, we're doing checkups on that. Yes, sir. The most important communication, my friend, is the communication with yourself. You mm. need me time. You need time to reflect. I can't do Eastern meditation. I wish I could. But a couple of times a week when I'm washing the convertible or in the mornings hitting the weights or doing my pinball marathon, I can decompress any sort of stimulation and put the phone away. And then when your mind wanders, you can take a breath on something. You might have overextended yourself or maybe didn't react enough. And then you can put things in perspective and then come back again. That's why I like when people can walk away from something or sleep on something, as you say, ponder something. And so, gentlemen, the most important way to keep yourself balanced and level is to give yourself that time as much as you can. And so that is my only suggestion in regarding to recharging my own batteries and, and center. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, do you do you journal or do you keep logs of that? Or is it just kind of in the moment and you allow yourself to decompress through thoughts or do you actually keep a journal of that in, in order to reflect Richard? I, I can write lists so I can remember, but usually mm. if something is in the moment, it's in the moment, like you and I could have heightened anxiety one time and I hate you. And then two minutes later, I'm like, 
I love Tums. I'm so sorry. He's like my best friend and I totally did something wrong. You understand those emotions. So I respect emotions in the moment, but the way that I am capable of using real deductive reasoning, logic, a neutral perspective is to almost literally separate myself through some sort of activity, breathing or distraction. So I'm capable of gauging what's going on, why I'm doing something. And so it enables me, you love the word maturity, that is maturity. Sometimes accepting fault, saying I'm sorry, or that I was wrong, or, or even if I'm not understanding it, Alex, please do me a favor. For my clarification, was it ABC? I, I want to understand and I don't want to be mad at you, but I'm dying to understand it on my end. And so that's a wonderful thing to do to somebody. As much as it's frustrating to have to explain it multiple times, if somebody is really trying to understand your position, take your time because that is an excellent way to meet in the middle or agree to disagree, but you're not gonna leave fighting and you're gonna live to fight another day. And these are the sort of things that I'm very insistent upon is to understand your position prior to sharing mine. So then I can adjust it accordingly. Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, oh. I was just gonna say huge takeaway. I mean, everything that you just said is a, uh, something that I've practiced for the last almost 18 years in relationship with my spouse. And it's why we've been able to maintain a good one is removing myself and, uh, you know, assuming her perspective for a second and realizing my own faults, flaws, shortcomings, and then being able to admit it. So some people <laughs> will say that's mature. Some people will say that's being a man uh, or all of the above. So I, I appreciate that confirmation there. Go ahead, brother. I'm that's that. big, man. Hey, that's big. Hey, 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 I was just, I was just gonna say, what's going on with these pinball machines? I wanted to see what's going on with that. I was like, hey, wait, what's going you on got with the Simpsons the pinball one? machine before we before we close out? What's now? How'd you get into pinball machines? How'd you get into collecting them? It's nostalgia. What's going on with that? Guys, I grew up in the '80s. The arcade was the place to be. And if you ever <laughs> remember the show Silver Spoons, I wanted that arcade, and so. Now that I earn a little bit of money and I have the space, I go treasure hunting and people have no idea what they have in their bodegas. And so a couple hours away, I'll kick a tire or two. And the next thing you know, I'm driving back in 1961, Ricola Regis behind me. And <laughs> I think those were amazing eras and the machines are beautiful. And the pinball is something that's not a PlayStation or an Xbox. And it just gives them a chance like Elton John's pinball wizard to really experience old school retro gaming. And so Generation X, it was the best. <laughs> so I'm just trying to introduce this to this new generation. Man, I loved having that roll of quarters and putting the quarters up on the machine. So I'm with you, man. I grew up, Richard, in the arcade. Right on the marquee on Asteroids, I got you. Oh man, oh, 19, 1942 and Galaga and Pinball. Yeah, that was all, all of my jams right there. You see Pac-Man up there making do, his yeah. cameo on the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was a big Ms. Pac-Man fan. Oh, I think because it was a little faster, but I but I enjoyed Pac-Man and all of that stuff, man. Dig Dug, Donkey oh, Kong, man. Yeah, throwbacks. I, I know barely what you guys are talking about. Centipede, my guy. Come on, bro. <laughs> Centipede. <laughs> uh, man, the classics. Well, you know, before we close out here, I just uh, want to ask you one question here, Rich, uh, Richard. Uh, is um, what's for the entrepreneur that's going through a struggle right now that may be um, going through that rut in their business um, and they they may not see a way out of it yes but they're but they're still they're still they're still plugging along they're still they're still working they're still doing their thing but you know they're they're in a rut right now uh, so what would you tell somebody that's going through a rut right now in their business and what can they uh, what can they focus on to uh, to in, to help them get out of it. They need to start in the beginning. Best bit of advice is to make your own bed. Yeah. So you can respect yourself in the morning and in the evening. Because if you can do small wins, those are first downs. And if you mm. can eat well, if you can have a sleep cycle, if you can exercise, iron your clothes, respect yourself, then you're getting a lot of wins. And if you're your best, then you can expand and be able to concentrate on others. And so I think that's the best way for somebody to begin. 
Small wins. First, small wins are first downs, bro. Hey, I love that. Yeah, that was it. That was a, a sound bite for sure. I, and I, I appreciate you saying that because I think we, we, Alex and I shared that same. Um, I'm going to say it's a truth. That is an absolute is to, uh, is to recognize those wins and celebrate them. I think the challenge for most people, Richard, is acknowledging that as a win. Like, like my wife makes the bed every morning because she's like, that's a win for me. For me, that's just a chore. And I'm like, ooh, that stinks. So I, I think the challenge for people usually lies in that six inches between their two ears in uh, what is a win and what they should consider a win and or progress, right, moving forward, um, especially when they're in those ruts. So I hope you guys got that, man. Celebrate those those first downs. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm a thousand percent with you, man. I'm a thousand percent with you. Um, no, Richard, I appreciate you working the working people find you. What, what, what websites do you have? Do you have a social media where, where can folks find you? Of course, first they can buy a first class ticket and fly down to visit me. <laughs> <laughs> but if, uh, they can't do that today. You can give me a call triple eight, two, seven, one, six, seven, five, zero. Shoot me an email at CEO at Costa Rica's call center.com. And we're all going to be putting this video is our Facebook fan page. 97,000 local Costa Rican Ticos, and they will give you a pulse on the business processes outsourcing industry in Costa Rica. I love oh, it, man. Uh, I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for hopping on with us today. And uh, and Thomas, man, you got anything to close out with? Well, I, I just need to know one more thing. Best cheesesteak in Philadelphia. <laughs> Where do we go? Oh, Someone could cut my head off if I give one, but I'm more of a South Street kind of guy. I guess I like gyms and people are going to yell at me for that. You got your Ooh. Pats and your Junos and, and wherever else you want to go, but um, it's your own individual taste. My only suggestion is put whiz on it. You got to get, get the whiz. Huh? Have an Adoroso <laughs> roll. That's all. Cool. There it is. I love it, man. I love it, man. Today was very informative. I, I, I learned a lot today. I mean, it took Thank a lot. Gentlemen. A lot. Took, took away a lot today as well. Yeah. Um, but For man, sure. just remember you guys go ahead, go to mpndpodcast.com. Please go check out uh, Richard Blank as well on his website. Uh, please like, share, comment, subscribe, drop a like. You know how it goes. But without any further ado, Thomas, what do we say? No pressure. No, no diamonds. diamonds. Let's get it. Yeah.